Hi, and welcome to Fantasy for the Ages, the show where a father and son sit down and talk about fantasy books. I'm the son in that equation, Zach. And that makes me the father, Jim. And once again, it's great to have all of you with us here today. We are back for another great episode of The Eye of the World as we're we working our way closer and closer to the end. Almost there. Yes, indeed. But we have some amazing and highly important occurrences to take place in the story, and we'll cover a bunch of them today. All right. But before we get into it, I believe we have a couple things to talk about first. We have at least three things that come to mind for me. Oh, yeah. There's my dad always noticing that a couple means two. That's right. I am a purist, perhaps, on that one. I know a bunch of you out there going, no, use a couple, like, for, It's you a know, general a vernacular things. term. I'm like, no, a, a few things. Even if you explain it that way, use a couple for a few things. No, use a few for a few things. Use a couple <sighs> for two. Couple is two, few is three to five, any more than that is many. A bunch. Apparently. <laughs> this has been my household growing up. And yet he still resists. Exactly. Of course. Why wouldn't I? Well, these things I wanted to talk about first off. Yes. Uh, First, just a fun thing to add in. Uh, We went ahead and ordered some, I should say I went ahead (laughs) and ordered some specific glassware and coasters that are Wheel of Time themed. And we are using them for the first time here today. Oh, yeah, no, it's great. I immediately dibsed the matte chapter heading coaster. So it's got the dice all up there. It just, it felt right. Yeah, and I'm going with the wolf. We might say it's Hopper, but you know, the Perrin-themed chapters. We've got a few others as well. The the glasses themselves have the general Wheel of Time logo on them, etched on it. And I'll show you by putting pictures on Instagram of what we have. But since we're using official glasses, I thought I needed an official drink. And it just kind of spurred to me that, hmm... I can add a little fun by trying out different drinks and giving you a recipe each episode. So I'm going to start that this time. Today, I am drinking something that I already it forgot the name blue. of. That's, it that's it is blue. That's as much as I know right now. I'm in the Indeed. dark with you guys. There it is. Walk Me Down is the name of the drink. Okay. Blue Curacao, gin, rum, tequila, triple sec, vodka, and sour mix. That sounds like a lot of things. If I start babbling before it's over, it is the drink's fault. Apparently. Sure it is. But I'll put the recipe on. I think it's tasty and you might like it too. (laughs) Don't have too many and then try to drive, perhaps. But feel free to let us know what you think. (laughs) Other business. Since we last recorded, we've picked up another YouTube follower. Ooh. Yeah, a guy named Scott. And he did something I totally get, definitely loved. He did the binge. Oh, goodness. Over a three-day period, he went through all 13 of our published episodes already. This is number 15 and... Number 14 is about to drop, but we have 13 out there already. He just plowed right through them. It was great. And he's commenting on (laughs) things that he agreed with and things he could add other perspectives on all the way through. It was a lot of fun to interact with a fan, somebody following along. Scott has already read the whole series. So that helps. He has that context as he tosses things into the conversation. That was great. And I love somebody binging our episodes. Mm -hmm. I've done that for some of my favorite podcasts. You know, the first one I really got deep into was Watt Spoilers. Mm. When I found it, they already had like 200 episodes out there. They they were pretty far along. And I just plowed through them all, pretty much listening to nothing else until I got current. And then, oh, now I have to wait for the next episode, (laughs) which is when I became a patron of theirs on Patreon and could start interacting on live episodes and getting early access. So it's a beautiful thing. But for people who come across like Scott and binge us, it's a bit less to get through. Yeah, 13. I look forward to, you know, like a year or two out <laughs> there and they find, oh, there's 100 episodes, 150 episodes. That will be great for them too. Now, for clarification, I mentioned he found us on YouTube. We are still exclusively an audio podcast. Oh, yeah. I'm not doing my hair and makeup for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd have to get dressed. He's not <laughs> sitting next to me naked. He's just wearing shorts. But, you know, we try to make sure our podcast is available anywhere people listen to podcasts. And some people, YouTube is where they like to listen. So it's still an audio podcast, but it's on YouTube as well. The last piece of business, we have a new patron. We do! This is exciting. Yes, so we want to give a shout out to DT, a Brooks Tier patron now of our podcast. Thank you so much. DT is a big Wheel of Time Mm -hmm. fan. 
He's one of the hosts of a very active Discord server, the Watt Trivia and Games server. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love it. We've both interacted on that server. It's a great place to be. Go check it out if you uh, haven't. Uh, Definitely. I'm going to include an invite to his server on our show notes. So people can jump on in. I know they have, I think, almost 500 people already connected to that server. You know, if if you want to be taken down a peg a little bit and come, (laughs) you know, pretend that you know a lot about Wheel of Time, this is a great way to to do it and play some trivia games with others. They do non-Wheel of Time trivia as well. Mm -hmm. So you can get hooked up with that. I encourage you to do so. and Maybe we'll see you there sometime. Anyways, thank you, DT. We appreciate it very, very much. Absolutely. Whoop, whoop. So Zach, how are you? How have you been doing? Um, I'm okay. I've been back in town now for a good week. Really kind of settling back into things. Need to pick up my routine a little bit better. Get used to waking up at a better time. <laughs> um, back to uh, West Coast time. Exactly. Everything's been a little out of whack and I'm definitely starting to get on that rebound. What about you? I'm doing good. Working out of the house all day and <laughs> still being amazed at how much I don't get some, don't get done some days. It happens. When you got a busy day, it'll happen. I did have one little interesting curveball in my week. I got the second dose of not the coronavirus vaccine, (laughs) the shingles vaccine, because I am that old. He's a little old. I had my first dose back in December. Got the second one now this past week because my doctor wanted me to get the second Mm -hmm. dose before I get my coronavirus vaccine. Don't want to mix up vaccines, apparently. And it knocked me on my butt for a day. I was like, oh, yeah, it's been fun seeing you uh, wince anytime something touches your arm. Oh, yeah. Leaves your arm kind of sore, but it's just slightly tender now. And and I'm I'm right as rain again. So and I will not get shingles now. Woohoo. That's right. Well, with that kind of stuff out of the way, we're all caught up with each other. How about we get into some content? I would love to get into the Wheel of Time. We've got five chapters to cover today. Uh, We start with chapter 35 called Camelin, and shockingly, we are back in Camelin. No. Yes, really, true. true. I don't believe you. No deceptive titles. Of course, this means we're getting back to Rand and Matt. When we left them, they were just arriving at Camelin, courtesy of a nighttime cart ride with Almond Bunt, if you remember that. Mm -hmm. And this picks up at the precise moment we had left them. So they are still on the cart with Almond Bunt coming up to the gates to go into Camelin. It's basically that cutscene moment. You crest a hill and welcome to Camelin. And the boys go, whoa. And now we pick up. And they're kind of like, oh, the end of the the sigh. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly where they are. We're finishing the sigh. Rand is amazed. He's gawking at this city. He had no idea something could be this huge. You know, it's been entertaining as they've mm-hmm. been, you know, Barillon. Oh, Such a big city. Yeah. You know, and then White Bridge. Oh. Such a big bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere they go, they keep finding these big places. But now, Camelin, shut the front door. Such a big everything. Yes. Bunt doubles down on this being the greatest city in the world. Okay. And he notes that it includes an outer city an inner city, and then the palace even further in, and that the inner city and the palace were built by Ogier. Okay. Now, I believe this is the first time Ogier are mentioned in the Eye of the World. I'll believe you on it simply because I don't necessarily remember if they were mentioned in passing earlier. And Um, it doesn't tell us anything else about Ogier here. Were they mentioned in the Steading chapter? Good point. They might have been. It would make sense. It would have made sense, sense, but but the name might not have been dropped. So why don't you guys go ahead and check that and tell us, yell at us, either way. Right here, where it's mentioned, Ogier and Steading are not tied together. Exactly. Right. But Ogier and Building are. Yeah. It's pretty much just a quick mention, but we know something. Ogier builds cities. We'll find out more later, I'm sure. Matt's reaction to Camelin is strikingly different from Rand. While Rand is amazed, excited, Matt is like, oh, too loud, too loud. There's too many people. And how will we possibly hide now? All these people, we can't trust anybody. They've this been is on terrible. the road trying to be on their own, and anytime they do run into people, it's bad. Yeah. And now they cannot escape them. There's no way. There's so many people. There's no way they can get away. And Rand is like, dude, you are missing the point. All of these people, we can just melt in and no one will be able to find us anymore. We don't need to hide from people because the people are our hiding place. That's right. Regardless, Matt stays very negative. He's very pessimistic. Rand really can't shake him out of it. 
Yeah. They move along with the crowds. The wagon just keeps rolling forward and they all funnel into the gates and there's guards there and they just kind of keep them orderly and moving along. Nobody stops them and boom, in we go. We're in Camelin now. That was smooth. Allman keeps riding down the main thoroughfare with his wagon and after a little ways, he turns off on a side road, pulls off just a little farther and then stops. And here he surprises the boys. It's like, all right, real talk for a sec. You guys, um... Well, first off, Rand, is that the sword? That That is the sword he was looking for back in the other town, right? The one that's supposedly, like, stolen? I'm not sure I believe that, but that's it, right? Uh, uh, you know, Matt is, like, grabbing towards his dagger, you know, and he's like, no, no, guys, it, it's fine. I, I don't care. I didn't want to be involved with any of I that. I took you all this way because I am a relatively upstanding person who just wants to know a little bit here. And a friendly piece of advice, if that's the sword, hide it, don't wear it. Sell it, give it away. People are going to see you. They're going to look. That sword is not going to help you hide. That's right. You want to stay hidden. That sword is bad news. So there you go. Uh, hope you guys do all right. And off he goes. Almond Bunt. Pretty nice guy. Really just a helpful face who disappears again. <laughs> Dumping a whole bunch of knowledge on us before he did. Oh, yeah. Yes. We always love the plot device that ends up being a massive lore dump. Right. Okay. So the boys have made it to Camelin. What now? Rand trusts that Moraine will find them, as she said she would. Matt's Matt, not so hopeful. Yeah, not at all. Again, very pessimistic. Everybody's dead. <laughs> it's like, dang, dude, lighten up. If someone finds them, it finds us, it's going to be a dark friend. Or, or the Mergerel. Ugh, we're just dead. I don't know if that's a good Matt voice, but... I mean, in this mode, maybe... Yeah. He's very end of the world doom. Yeah, he's pretty much close to giving up all hope. Yeah. Rand just tries to shake him out of it. He says, Not very know, successfully. He says, hey, at least what we can do is go to the inn Tom told us to go to. Let's because find the Queen's blessing. If there's one person that they know they still can trust, it's the guy who, as far as they know, gave his life for them to f- keep them from getting got by a murderer. There you go. So they ask around for directions. Initially, they don't get any help. Just no. dismissive treatment for a couple of country bumpkins. Not to mention, they probably look dirty and up to no good. Well, and they also, this, this strikes me as they have no cognizance of the scope of Camelin. You know, you walk into a town and you ask, hey, where's this? Imagine we walk into Portland and we say, hey, where's this restaurant? I don't know. I feel like Portland, they might be able to tell you. But I walk into New York City and go, hey, can you tell me where this little hole in the wall place is? And if I'm in the right section of the city, sure. If I'm not, I'm screwed. Right. So I imagine a bunch of these people, they're asking, they have no idea. Queen's Blessing? You know, it's, it's one of many inns. Who knows? But also, like you said, how they look, mm, people don't necessarily care to help them. The bigger the city, the more callous people can get. Yeah. We it, don't know you. Leave us alone. They're also mention... running into some of the conflict of people lumping them in to being all these out-of-towners here for the false dragon, and we're tired of all these strangers. And there's an added problem, per se, a bit of tension that they begin to notice that has to do with some colors. It's red or white, whether it's on their clothes or wrapped around uh, sometimes swords. And there seems to be a certain connotation of one group, how they regard another. Yeah. They notice that, you mentioned swords, they notice every local who's wearing a sword has it wrapped. It's Mm -hmm. one of those two colors, red or white. So they said, you know, if we want to get people to treat us a little better let's at least try to blend in yeah we pretend we're locals who just like are from the other side of town or something and he's already dealing with that circumstance where he has the heron mark sword which Almond told him you know hide that thing well how about hide it in plain sight let's wrap it like any other normal sword it won't stand out yeah it might be a little pretty ish but it's wrapped enough that you definitely don't see the heron that's right looks like everybody else's swords so he stops at one of the shops that's selling such material And the shopkeeper is dismissive of them, just like everybody else has been. But hey, they got money, so okay, I'll let you buy something. There's red, there's white. Which one to buy? The cheaper one. That's how it goes, because they barely have any coin (laughs) left. So red is cheaper. They buy the red, they wrap it up, and now he's wearing red. They have no idea what the red or the white signifies. This is Star Trek, right? It means they're going to die. They're going to die. He went red. No. Uh. (laughs) With the wrapping of the sword accomplished, they get back to searching. Now, long story short, they do eventually find the Queen's Blessing. It's pretty nice. And uh, the guy who runs it, his name is Basil Gill. He's fat. Exactly. (laughs) 
He's a fat, pleasant innkeeper. With that kind of heft, he must be trustworthy. No, but Rand and Matt, eventually, they lead with the name Tom Marilyn, and... Oh! There's a little bit of a look around, make sure no one's... Clearly he knows Tom. We can see that right away. Clearly he also knows Tom sometimes is up to no good, but he's a friend. And if he wants to help these boys, then so will Basil go. So Basil wants to be a little more sure of what's going on here first, though. So he takes them through the inn, out the back, into the stable yard, and says, All right, let's 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 talk. Tell me more about how you know Tom, because what is that you're carrying there, boy? He points to the flute case mm-hmm. Rand has. And Rand says, it's Tom's flute case. He's like, Tom wouldn't have just given you his flute case. He wouldn't part with that unless he's practically dead. They also have the harp case, do they not? Yeah, but he doesn't see that. It's not out visible. How big is that thing? I don't know, but the book doesn't say anything about the harp case. So I'm assuming that's in one of their saddlebags or something. But the flute case is clearly visible. Basil says this thing about Tom would have to be dead. And they say, well, uh, sorry, he's dead. (laughs) <laughs> and they, you know, they, they tell a story and they don't tell them everything, but they give them the tale of how they were being chased by people. And they tell about Moraine and Aes Sedai who was helping them. And from her, they learned these are dark friends. They don't know why they're after them. And Tom fell in with them, was willing to help them because of his nephew. And he didn't care for Moraine. He didn't trust her fully, but he stayed because of the nephew. And they got separated when they were attacked by dark friends. And then they made it, Tom and and Matt and Rand made it to Whitebridge where they were attacked again. And Tom died saving them Mm -hmm. from the attackers and shoved this stuff in, in our hands and said, get to Camelin, find the Queen's Blessing. It's mostly a truthful story. However, there are some significant pieces missing, and the boys have finally learned you don't just throw these things around because people will think you're crazy. That's right. Don't spill everything. Uh, Gil, however, shares a sentiment that I bet almost every reader, most of the people who know anything in this story, all assume, and that's Tom's probably not actually dead. Yeah, he he's clearly known Tom Marilyn for years. He references this guy can handle himself. I will believe he's dead when I see his corpse. (laughs) He also then, this also, you know, tells something that he knows about Tom. He says, hmm, so you guys must have some trouble with Aes Sedai. They're like, oh, what? We didn't say say anything about Aes Sedai. Yeah, but it was Tom. Yeah, he said, you know, if Tom was coming with you to Camelin, it had to be for something big and helping a couple of young lads who are caught up with Aes Sedai... That's about the only thing that would get Tom to do it. Apparently, there's something in the past that Tom really would not go to Camelin. And then Gil kind of awkwardly hints at asking, are one of you channelers? No, 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 no. No, it's not that. It's not that. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Master Gil, (laughs) he assumes that they can't pay for room and board, which is correct. They're pretty much out of money. They spent it all on cheap cloth. As friends of Tom's, I will take care of you anyways, though. I'm happy to put you up, feed you, board you, and we'll wait around for Tom to catch up, because I'm sure he will. He mentions it'd probably be best if they don't talk about Aes Sedai any further, because while he's a good Queen's man, there are plenty around Camelin that wouldn't take well to hearing such words out of them. And truthfully, Gil himself doesn't really love the Aes Sedai. He just doesn't hate them either. Right. You know, there appears to be some strong feelings about Aes Sedai and Camelin these days, and, and Almond Bunt had indicated some of that in the last chapter we'd had. A little with bit. Rand and Matt. But, you know, Morghese has an advisor who's an Aes Sedai, Elida, but it's just not a popular thing these days. Hold on, how do you say that? Elida, sorry. Hey, he fixed it, everybody. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> uh, last bit we get in this chapter is the reveal of why Tom isn't likely to prefer to be in Camelin these days. Uh-oh. Tom was previously court barred here. That's like a in step Caitlin. up from a gleam. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, you've reached the top level. You mm. know, that's mm. as high as you go uh, in his profession. Gotcha. Gotcha. He gotcha. was known across the land in all the royal courts. You know, like Basically, you're the top dog. Anyone yeah, who was knows anyone you. knew that if you wanted entertainment, Tom's your guy. When Queen Morghese was widowed after the death of Terengil Damadred, she and Tom apparently had a fling. This is what Gil reveals. And, you know, he's like, I'm not going to judge. You know, Morghese is a grown woman. She could do as she wished. But, hmm. 
But while they were apparently hot and heavy, Tom took off. He had heard about his nephew being in some trouble with Aes Sedai, and he went to try to help. He, he didn't also tell didn't Morgis say anything. At all. He just poof disappears. Don't and, ghost your girl, especially oh, if she's a queen. And then he comes back, and he tells her then what he'd been off to do. And she is ticked about him having ghosted her, as you say. Yeah. And that he was trying to muck around in Aes Sedai business, which she says is none of his business. And, of course, we know it's about his nephew. Mm -hmm. So there's some harsh words, some hard feelings. Apparently Tom said things that, A, you should never say to a woman. And, B, you definitely should never say to a queen. <laughs> exactly. And he ends up fleeing Camelin ahead of the queen's guard just before he gets thrown into prison. But, hey, at least he avoided execution. Which would have been a possibility for and sure. And probably would be likely if he ever returned. So Gil's like, so in light of all that, you might not want to mention being friends with Tom either. You know, maybe drop his name and say, yeah, we hated that guy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, no. <laughs> now he doesn't say that. No, but... There is another significant character that's named here. And since yes. we like to highlight things that will be important, I want to throw this in. Basil Gill mentions a key reason not to say anything about Tom is because some of the guards who were involved back then in trying to capture Tom are still around. They're still around. And in fact, the one who led the contingent is now the captain of all of them. That's right. The one who had to come back to Morgase and say, sorry, he got away. Gareth Bryn. Yeah, he's the top dog now. I know that this one is Bryn. I know, that, like Brian, I know that I am wrong, but I say Brian. I always I know say that Brian, I'm wrong. But I've learned better since. Not Gareth Brian, Gareth Bryn. I'm okay with him being like a pickle or something. That's fine. If you still say Gareth Brian, you know how we feel on this. Do it wrong, do it strong. It's all good. That's where we've ended up for chapter 35. We move on to chapter 36 called right. Web of the Pattern. Let's go. Gil brings the boys in the common room. He gets them a meal. And while they're eating, he's pumping them for the rest of their story. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You get people comfortable, you feed them, and they will tell you anything. That's right. Everything is explained now. And as we mentioned before, they've learned not to truly tell everything. Oh, yeah. so they still don't say anything There's about no Trollocs, of Trollocs fades, or fades. But they do mention some dark friends. Because, you know, that's just universal. They're bad people. Yeah. Rand really wants to make sure that if Master Gill is going to help them because they're friends of Tom, that he understands there are really dangerous people after us. And even though they won't mention the Fades or Trollocs, at least that he knows it's dark friends. You know, bad, bad people. You seem like a good person and we're sorry that we're getting you into this. We're still going to get you into this, but you should know what you're getting into, kind of. Gill is like, don't worry about it. I got it covered. We're fine. I'm not going to turn my back on a friend of Tom's. Besides, again, I don't think Tom's really dead. He'll show up. You guys are welcome to wait here. And he says, you know, I'll keep an eye out for Moraine, for your other friends. If Someone they... like Moraine shows up in the city. Word will people spread. People notice. Mm -hmm. I'll kind of keep my ear to the ground. I'll let you know what we hear. And Rand goes, hey, you said there was an Aes Sedai advisor uh, to the queen. Yeah, Maybe she I can go? help us. Should I go to Elida? Elida? <laughs> And Gil shuts that down so fast. Uh, if you go and talk to her, she has a way of, of hearing and knowing more than you want to say. She'll figure out you have a connection to Tom. That won't end well for you. It might end with you and Cells. Now, I have Bad a question. Call. Yeah? Do we hear get an insight into differing Ajas yet? We've had some before because it's we've had mention of what the Red Aja are like. Do we hear the Lida is? I think we do. I know we will find out later, but I don't know if we do here. I think we do. But anyways, yeah, she's Red Aja. If we spoiled it for somebody, forgive us. So with the possible trouble that Gil thinks they might be in, even if the boys deny it, he definitely is not sending them that way. So just wait here. Tom or Maureen will show up eventually. He leaves them to finish their meal, and once alone, Matt goes off on a paranoid tirade. It's pretty standard Matt in this book. But he's getting more and more dark, suspicious of everything. He even suggests, and you know, Gil, he like, we, we're not even paying him, and he just gives us a room and food. What if he's a dark friend? Yeah, who, who would do that? There's Rand, no such thing as good people. Yeah, Rand again talks him down, gets him to stop raving. <sighs> they finish their meal. The serving girl shows them up to their room. They get the penthouse. Not really. It's in the attic, though. It's the top room. You know, I don't know if it's the only room in the attic, but it is the attic room. Mm -hmm. 
Once there, Matt just throws him onto one of the beds, clothes, boots, and all. He just kind of shuts down, turns against the wall. I imagine the child who's afraid of the monsters in their closet who jumps in the bed and throws the blanket over them thinking, if I can't see you, you're not real. (laughs) Maybe. Rand leaves him be goes down to the common room to try to relax and unwind. Finds that Matt's paranoia has kind of affected him, and he keeps twitching every time a new person walks into the common room. There's just, there's still too many people. He can't relax. He asks a serving maid, is there another room with less people, and more private? And there is. There is. There's a library. One of my favorite rooms anywhere. She gives him directions. He goes off to this library room. He walks in and Wow, there's books, more books in one room than he's ever seen. And if you remember way back when we started this, Mm -hmm. we know that they had books, him and his dad, in their home. They really valued books. That's what they do most evenings. They'd kick back. Yeah, they had a total of like five books. It was great. This has tons of books. It's amazing. So he's like gawking at the books. And then... I like to think of it as, you know how Beauty and the Beast, what really gets Belle to be like, maybe the Beast isn't a bad person and I'm going to stay here. This is fine is she walks in and there's a massive library. It, it's that kind of reaction. Interesting you should mention Beast. Oh, yeah. Because as he's gawking at the books, then he hears a voice, you know, basically, oh, uh, excuse me, much deeper than that, probably. He's not alone, and he turns, and he sees this massive creature, and he thinks, Trollic! <laughs> I'm being attacked right in the library. All Rand knows is, A... It's not human. B, it's taller than he is. It's and almost he's, 10 feet tall. He's really tall. And C... Yeah, it's not just taller than he is. I mean, almost hits the yeah. ceiling. C, there is nothing he's seen or heard of that is anything remotely like that except for a trollic. So Rand literally lets out a just inarticulate yell and tries to draw his sword, but is so startled he trips over his own two feet and falls on his butt. Which is a good thing. A lot of good all that training landed, did, But though. this was a good thing, because it's not a Trolloc. And I'm not going to say what it is yet. Now, yeah, okay, I'll tell you what it is. I mean, that's the next thing in the notes. It's literally <laughs> the next sentence. This is Loyal, introduces himself, and over the course of the conversation they're about to have, he comes to discover this is an Ogier. Loyal um, is super tall. Yep. He's got a big nose. It covers most of his face. Not sticking out so much, but broad. Yep. His eyebrows are really the most notable thing, in my opinion. And they're mentioned often, over and over and over. Not just bushy eyebrows. They are bushy. They are long. They droop. They're practically antenna. Yeah. And he just, he is big. His eyes are really big. His hands are massive. It describes his eyes as the size of teacups. I mean, huge. When they eventually kind of settle down, we get a really clear difference between Rand who is massive for a human, and Loyal, who just is massive, as they shake hands and Rand's hand is completely swallowed. It's the three-year-old shaking a fully grown man's hand. Exactly. So, he's met in gear. We get a whole bunch of information dropped here, and I have tried to summarize this conversation. All right, let's hit the main points. And I, I just want to comment. It was really hard to summarize this conversation because there are so many things shared here that become important well, over the course of the series, so you can't really leave these things out. Let's be real. Loyal is a walking lore dump. He is a plot device who is a fantastic character, but he's also Robert Jordan in the flesh. But most of these things are specific to Loyal and Ogier yes. that we're going to learn here now. One thing we learn is that he finds humans very excitable. <laughs> they overreact so easily. He was disappointed that no one recognized him as an Ogier when he arrived in Camelin four days ago. Apparently, nobody really remembers the Ogier. So how long has it been since they've seen them? He was actually chased by a mob across the town with shouts of Trolloc! Trolloc! Until the Queen's Guard showed up and broke it up. The Queen's Guard at least realized he was in Ogier. He made it to this inn, and since that reaction, he hasn't gone outside again <laughs> for four days. He just sat in the library and read books. Now, however, while it has been four days, truthfully, that isn't viewed as a long time, as 
Loyal is 90 years old and still isn't really considered a full adult by Ogier standards. Right. Apparently Ogier are now considered not considered grown up until they hit the ripe old age of 100. So he's like a teenager in the world of Ogier. That gives you an idea of how long they live as a whole. I like to think of him as like a like a high school senior, wanting that independence but not really deserving it. <laughs> And he did. He wanted to get out and see the world. He he was a rabid reader. A rabid reader. Rabid, avid, either way. Yeah. And all these things he'd read about, these places around the world, different cities and cities that the Ogier had helped build and the great groves of trees that they had planted in those same locations. He wanted to go see them for himself. And so he requested permission to leave because apparently you're not allowed to leave until you are an adult. So he was a little too young to go out on his own. There seems a, a strict authoritarian structure to Ogier society at this point, but it's not really clear exactly what that means or entails. Yeah, not yet. But we get uh, another indication of how their long-livedness impacts how longevity? they look at things. Yeah, longevity. That's a nice word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that they don't feel a need to move quickly on anything. No. So he makes the request, and they call a meeting where such decisions are made, which is called the stump. So they're having a stump. And the meeting hasn't been going very long, only a year, when Loyal loses patience and says, you know, I'm just going to go anyways, because by the time they make up their mind, I probably will be 100. And I don't want to wait that long. So the stump is basically Congress trying to decide on a budget, right? That sounds fair. <laughs> <laughs> so Loyal has left. And in fact, he comments, I wonder if they've even noticed I'm gone yet. And he's started looking for things and he is shocked to see how much the world has changed. One of the things he noticed is people don't recognize Ogier. Yeah. I mean, it hasn't been that long they since also... we've been out, out and about. And yet... It has been because he's finding all these cities that he read about and they all have new names except Camelin. Most of them have new names. Most of the groves are cut down. The great trees Sometimes he read about. not even remembered. Aren't, exactly. And these great trees aren't there anymore in a lot of places. Yeah, the description of the groves were these artistic plantings of a wide variety of trees that were in perfect harmony mm -hmm. and beautiful. And it was to remind the Ogier of the steadings. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But the great trees mm -hmm. are described as you would think of a redwood. I mean, if you have never had the opportunity, and I don't know if it was impacted by any of the uh, wildfires over the last few years, but the there's a place... Like wildfires, actually. But the place itself, the infrastructure might have changed. Calaveras. Calaveras Big, big, big Trees trees. State Park. It's a great place, and there is a tree that has been cut down at this point, but I want to say around... I remember seeing it as a child. In my memory, it's... The at, stump? <laughs> well, at least like a half-court basketball court across, at least. And just imagining how big that would have been, I'm like, this, this is a great tree. So they, they planted these groves, and he was hoping to see them, but he's not finding any of them left, uh, at least not so far. He said he's been to Kirian, and theirs was gone, and now he's come to Camelin, and yep, the city's been built right over it. But they built these when they were in exile. We learn about this, that after the breaking of the world, the Ogier lost their steadings, their special homes, and they couldn't find them, so they wandered. And during that time, they picked up a new skill, which was working with stone, becoming stonemasons. Exactly. And they did it exceptionally well so that they were hired. As the world started rebuilding, they were the ones called on to build some of the biggest and best things, like the inner city and palace here in Camelin. Therefore, a lot of the oldest, best, prettiest things are Ogier made. And whenever they were settling down for a time to do that, they would plant a grove to remind them of the steading that they were searching for still. And eventually, they did find their steadings again. And the groves were still then places that when they'd go back to do some repairs on a city that they had built. It was nice they could as a reminder. The grove. It was a nice thing, yeah. During that exile, that long time, we also hear that they developed something called the longing. 
And it's never super explained, but the longing no. is some sort of physical condition which comes upon Ogier that they can die from, some sort of wasting disease. It almost feels like withdrawal, but more from an area than a substance. Mm, okay. As if the air itself is a drug to them that allows them to continue living normal. They have to return to the steadings now that they have them, and they can't leave them for too long. It's not defined on how long is too long. Especially when we consider Ogier and their scale of time. Yeah, they look at time quite differently. Because of that, they simply don't tend to stay out of the steady. They tend to stay home. Ogier have become home bodies, I do which think... is why people don't know what Ogier are anymore. I do think later on in the series, we get a loose approximation for what might be too long, but we'll wait till we actually yeah, see it. since we're not there yet. Now, the conversation gets just a touch awkward when it comes out that Loyal believes he's talking to an Aiel. He makes some comments about things that he figures Rand would totally connect with and understand, and Rand is totally blank-faced, clueless. What are you talking about? He's saying, you know, as an Aielman, you would know this. He's like, I'm, he's like, not, I'm Aiel. not Aiel. I'm from the Two Rivers. Loyal has no idea. Loyal's like, well, I'm sure that's a very nice place. And Rand goes, well, I got told it was called Manetherin, and oh, oh yes, we know Manetherin. Manetherin. And then oh. he's like, wow, you're nearly as far from home as I am coming to Camelin. Why are you here? Why have you traveled that far? And here we get something very interesting. Rand tells Loyal the whole story. Something he has not done to this degree in a long time. From winter night all the way to now. I mean, even going back right before, you know, from first seeing the dark rider on the quarry road, he tells Loyal everything. There's one spot where he hiccups just a little, where he starts to talk about the dreams, mm -hmm. and he, he bites his tongue. He, he, he hasn't mentions, even told he mentions Lorraine bad about dreams, that. but he doesn't tell, you know, seeing Biles Amon in my dream and all that. He doesn't say that. For reference, I turned around to look at the map here a moment ago. Because for some reason, it was in my brain. It felt like Loyal didn't travel as far as Rand. And it is about the same distance. Rand actually traveled a little bit further according to the map. But who says it's accurate? We don't know the scale after all. Loyal hears this whole tale. And then he says, Ooh, Taverin. I'm sorry, what? Taverin. I wasn't correcting your pronunciation. I was just <laughs> I making a reaction. I don't know what comes out of my mouth each time. But yes, it's a thing. It says it's, it's not obvious English. obvious to Loyal that Rand is a Taviran. What's a Taviran, Zach? Right. So to explain this, I have to go a little bit into what is the pattern and the idea that time itself is woven. And it's woven on millions of threads, and all of these threads are people's lives. What they'll do, how they are, things that interact. A Taviran is something that serves as kind of a central point that the other lives weave around. It gets a little bit less of a choice on how it then is woven, but other pieces of the pattern weave itself around them. So then when we apply that to human lives, there is a purpose, a destiny for a singular strand of the pattern, a singular person, and people around them are going to morph around in a way that events force certain outcomes and certain things to happen in ways that they quote unquote need to. There is an understanding that the wheel, as the wheel turns and the pattern is moving along, certain things need to happen. And if things start to steer off course too far, the wheel will spin out a Taviran to cause a course correction. Mm -hmm. And everything else is, is warped by this Taviran, and things just flow a certain way because the Taviran effect. It's <laughs> kind of like an autocorrect that actually works. Yes. So <laughs> Rand's like, what? <laughs> I'm a Taviran? Okay. Uh, and Loyal's saying, yes, you, you are certainly Taviran. Perhaps your friends as well. And, you know, that's kind of cool. I, I think I want to travel with you. Hold on. Didn't you hear about all the, like, danger, the life-threatening stuff, people dying? He's not worried. And he says, in fact, you said you're next going on to Tarvalon. Nope. No, no. Tarvalon. Try again. I heard it on another podcast. And you heard that, that, that it was wrong they said still. Tarvalon. But you heard I'm that it was going still with it now. It's Tarvalon. <laughs> he says, you know, in, in Tarvalon, they still uh, have their grove. And I want to see it. Their, their great grove still exists. So I'm definitely going with you. End of chapter. We move to chapter 39. So we're jumping over a couple chapters that we studied in our last 
yes. Eye of the World episode. This is called Weaving of the Web. Some time has passed now. And we start off with Rand and Matt up in their attic room. Matt has clearly gone further and further downhill. Mm -hmm. He won't leave the room anymore. Rand has to bring his meals up. He won't even take a bath. God, it stinks. It's a classic case of social anxiety, paranoia, and depression all wrapped into one. Pretty much, I think the only one he will even talk to or trust at all is Rand. But even that is beginning to become tenuous. He's familiar with Loyal, but he refers to him as Rand's Trolloc. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, he man. does not believe for a second that Ogira so are a thing. negative. <laughs> Rand is excited about this day, and he's trying to use this specialness of today to get Matt to finally leave the room, and it doesn't work. And did you say what the special I day did is? not. What is the special day, Zach? It's something that we've been hearing about since the beginning of the book, really, but at all their journey, they've been hearing this was going to happen, and that's Loghain, the false dragon, is going to be paraded through the town and then presented in front of Queen Morghese. Finally. Rand wants to see this false dragon. Matt is not coming. Not having it. Won't leave the room. So, okay, finally he gives up on him, and he's going to head off on his own. As he's heading down the stairs and going to head out of the inn, Master Gill catches him. Mm -hmm. And he shares, you know, seeing that he's leaving the inn, understanding you want to see Loghain. I get that. Everyone wants to see Loghain. Uh, you should know, word has come to me, there is a beggar who's been asking about you. You and your friends, uh, clearly, particularly the three boys, you, Matt, and that other boy you've told me about, Perrin. He's looking for you guys. He's been asking around. One guess on who that is. And he says beggars are really be unknown in Camelin because if you are in need, you go to the Queen's court. They they have an annual, not annual, I think it's weekly distribution of stuff. They, have you know, a, they take care of poor you know, people. They have a decent food stamp program and nice free housing at times for those in need. There it's, should never be a beggar as sketchy as this dude is that we're here. Yeah, it's very progressive, especially in times of re-election or civil war. Yeah. As Camelin would have it. So he's like, so be warned, this guy's out there somewhere. Keep your eye out, eyes open. Also, he says, you know, you've got your sword with you, and you're a good queen's man like me, you know, wrapped in red. So we learn, haha, red means queen's man. You support Queen Morghese and her having a... And her red Aja... Aes Sedai advisor, you know, whatever she decides you're going to support because you're a good queen's man. The white ones are the ones who stand for the Aes Sedai, are the problem in the world. Let's be real here. Everything that's going wrong these days, it's all Tarvalon's fault. Tarvalon's fault. Uh, white stands for white cloaks. They're not white cloaks, but they sympathize. There certainly is rumor that the white cloaks are actively supporting this initiative. I would yes. argue that the white-wrapped swords are white cloak sympathizers. They tend to shift towards the ideals that drive white. So Oops. he says, you've got your sword. You might want to kind of cover that up a little bit because there seems to be a lot more white out there than red today. It's probably about a two to one ratio. It could cause almost. you some trouble if you get noticed. So just so you know. All right, Rand heads off. He works his way around to where the, uh, shall we call it the parade route? Yeah, it's, is. it's very Disney. And it seems like it because there's people piled many people back along the route. It's very frustrating. You want to get from one side to the other and you have to go a huge detour just because it's roped <laughs> off. <laughs> people with Mickey Mouse ears <laughs> waving people along. Yeah, the yeah. bubble guns going as well. And... <laughs> If you've never been to Disneyland anywhere, that, that makes, makes no, no sense, sense then, to like, you. But if you have... Well, how many people have not been to Disneyland or Disney I mean, World now? Come on. We have some foreign listeners who may or may not have. I know there are. there's one in Paris. The Euro there's one Disney. in, I think, Tokyo now. Yeah, you know. Um, but who says you've been? <laughs> and we've been how many times now? It, uh, quite a few. It's been a while since the last... No, it hasn't been too long since the last time because I most recently when I was at college, was actually close to it. Mm -hmm. Didn't go t as often as I would have liked, though. So he eventually does make it to where a good spot to merge into the crowd and see. And, you know, again, Rand is six foot nine, so he does not to be in need to be in front. He wiggles his way through, so he's three people back, which is ticking off anyone who's behind yeah, him, cause, of course, because he's six foot nine. He's tall enough at three people back to see. He sees over the child and their parent in front of him, and then the person who's trying to see over their shoulder, and then there's Rand, and he's fine, and everyone behind him sees nothing. Yeah. It's okay. At least he's not loyal. When he's there, there's nothing happening yet. They're waiting, but then he sees something happening on the other side of the road. There's like a ripple going through the crowd, and he's like, 
what's going on? Uh, hmm. And everybody around him is also looking at this ripple. And then out of the ripple, there pops <gasps> the beggar. Ooh. Unclean, dirty, Ooh. don't touch him. And then the beggar kind of writes himself once he's broken free, looks straight in Rand's direction, reaches his clawed hand out, and starts moving straight at Rand. That's kind of sus. Yeah. So Rand is like, I do not want to deal with this guy. Nope, Question. Nope, nope. Beggar hooded. Can he see his face? I feel like Rand does not recognize him in this moment. Yeah, there's no recognition. But I think he can see his face. He just looks so horrible that he doesn't recognize anything about this guy. Okay. This beggar. He just sees someone he wants to ditch. He turns around, pushes his way back out of the crowd again, and runs. And he goes fast because he knows once the beggar gets to the crowd they're gonna part like the red sea because ew you know the ripple effect will not help rand right now he runs and runs and runs until he figures he's gone long enough that he's probably ditched him now let's be real here if the dude coming out of a crowd can instantly point to him he probably was not just looking by sight he's not lost him but maybe rand lost him for now does at that point have a little bit of choice he gets to consider where does he go next he considers going to the inn and he decides not to for a dumb reason rather than a smart reason. Why a dumb reason? The smart reason would be don't go to the inn in case you didn't actually lose the person because then you've literally led them to where you're staying. The dumb reason is, oh, there's something great going on and I don't want to miss it. He has FOMO. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity, he figures. Dad, can you tell me what FOMO stands for? Absolutely not. It's fear of missing out. I think I maybe heard that somewhere. And Rand is heavily experiencing right now. But it's a common thing. You don't want to miss this once in a lifetime opportunity. Absolutely. And so he, he decides does have a good to idea. go somewhere else. Let's go somewhere else. He says, I'm not going to try to make my way back to the crowd. I'm going to think about the terrain of mm -hmm. this city. As we get closer towards the palace, it starts to rise. And you've got hills. And so there's elevation. Mm -hmm. I ought to be able to find some locations where I can have a line of sight from above and see the route without actually being right up there with the crowd. Oh, yeah. Unlike me, Rand has good eyes and can see well <laughs> at a distance without any help. He figures he can look from a distance and be fine. And so he does. He starts searching. He spends about an hour looking for a good vantage point. He finds quite a few, and each one's already taken. Because <laughs> other people had the same brilliant idea. Probably locals who knew what was mm, going on. Maybe. He's pretty much reached a point where he's given up. I, I just, I guess I'm not going to be able to see. And then he has a, like a brainstorm. Wait a second. He's walking along this trail. It's right next to a really tall wall. Really tall. There's a little slope of mm -hmm. dirt that normally would probably be planted and all, but there's nothing growing in it right now. And he could scurry up that slope, climb the wall. He looks at the wall and it's like rough. There's mm -hmm. plenty of hand grooves and stuff. I could scale that wall. If I make it to the top of that thing, I bet I will be able to see. So there's one of three things going on here. Either one, Rand is a parkour master and is going to just scurry up that thing like it's a warped wall in American Ninja Warrior. Two, it's not, it's not that. this wall is actually human-made and has deteriorated over time. Or three, Ogier Masons are not as great as they have seemed to be, and for some reason, a defensive wall has a ridiculous amount of footholds and handholds for him to climb. Have you not seen a wall that's made aesthetically beautiful by looking a little more natural? Oh no, I have, but I've also had the opportunity you have not, to go through a lot of older stone construction in Europe. And there are fantastic castles, fantastic things. And I look at this and go, yes, it's rough. It's not gonna be something you can easily climb. I don't believe this wall isn't intended as a defensive wall though. This is just a wall because the whole city has defensive walls. This is just inside How do you think medievalish buildings were built you have a series of walls protecting first the outer city then the inner city then the castle then the keep i don't think it's needed for granted that. those walls weren't necessarily always great either that's why you had other systems like moats and dropping oil and we're getting on a huge tangent yeah, of zach trying too to much be wall, man. Too a much wall. nerd i'm hitting a wall now all and right? probably saying things incorrectly anyways <laughs> he climbs the wall Okay, he does it, and he does it really fast because as he's like wavering, should I do this? He hears the drums and the trumpets. It's the parade. It's here now. It's coming. He's, it's coming. He, if he's going to do it, he's got to do it now or he's going to miss his chance to see. So he scurries up. He goes really fast. He scrapes himself up pretty good doing so because he can't be careful. 
He makes it to the top, hefts himself up, spins himself around, plops his butt on the top. It's flat, he can sit, now he can kind of lean out, and yes, he has line of sight. He can see the route, and he can see the group just starting to come along it. He sees a whole bunch of Camelin soldiers, first mm -hmm. of all kinds, you know, foot soldiers, cavalry, pikemen, all sorts, archers, they're, they're marching along. And after a whole bunch of them, then he finally sees a massive wagon, a flatbed wagon, with what well, almost looks... like 16 horses that's just indicated mm -hmm. it's big it's a big wagon but it almost looks like there's a a large bird cage almost just on a top. little cage right in the center of this and big flatbed there's a man inside yes and at the corners at all four corners there's two women at each corner sitting staring at this cage and around the flatbed there's a bunch of very burly men <laughs> very warrior-like uh, riding horses around it that Would Rand goes, wait a second, okay, I think those women are Aes Sedai, and those are the warders. It's arguable to say they are reminiscent of Lan, if yeah. not quite living up to his caliber. They kind of have the same cloak, he notices. It's hard to, you know, they, they kind of seem a little hard to keep your eye on. Okay, Aes Sedai, warders, that's got to be Loghain then in the cage. He doesn't know what exactly is going on with the women all sitting in the corner staring at him, but that's Loghain. And yet, as he looks in, he realizes this is not a man beaten. Oh, he's kind of creeped out because he looks still like a king. Like he, he's in control. Almost as if this is a parade in his honor, not yeah. to he, bring he, him down. He just stares around and he has such power still that everywhere he looks, the crowd kind of hushes and, and cringes back. And then he turns away and then they yell even louder after he looks away. But it's like they don't want to yell at him when he's looking at them. <laughs> and then something weird kind of happens. Loghain does give a reaction. Yeah, the only reaction. As he's finally being pulled in through the palace gates, he turns back, looks at them one more time. And he laughs. However, and back bursts out laughing. I don't think it's specified here. And we're not going to say anything we, about why yet. We will eventually get the reasoning This is important this. that he laughs. But there is something that happens that triggers Loghain to laugh. And, and we will, will find learn out later. Many books later. Like on book eight. We can also emphasize the fact that Loghain, foreshadowing, he will remain a important character in this series. Yeah. Okay, this is all you're gonna see of him right now, but he'll be back. No matter how beaten down, no matter how gone, he'll be back. So Rand, he leans out just a little further to try to get one last glimpse and almost falls off the wall. It's like, whoa, grabs back again. But he catches himself, he's fine. And as he's steadying himself, he <laughs> shivers at almost falling. And he says aloud to himself, why were the Aes Sedai watching him? And suddenly a tree we didn't realize was there, a girl who was in there apparently says they were keeping him from touching the tree source, silly, and oh goodness, now he's gonna actually fall. Yeah, Rand is so startled, he loses his balance. Falls over backwards off the wall, and the chapter ends as he strikes his head, going unconscious. Rand can climb walls. He has great eyesight. He has zero situational awareness. Apparently. This brings us to chapter 40. The, the web, web Titans. Yes, the Web Titans. And now, if you're going to say the title, you got to warn me so we don't talk over no, each other. No, we can totally talk over each other. It's like that synchronous, we're talking together thing. It makes it more powerful. <laughs> Yeah, you're not the one who edits these, okay? You can always cut me out. <laughs> it's not that easy. All right, Rand comes to. His whole skull hurts. Oh, man. He's probably got a concussion. He's sitting on the ground, and he's on green grass. And he's like, oh, I fell over the wrong side of the wall. <laughs> oh, no. Where If only I, I had fallen on the side that I clambered up, then I could just run away at this point. He's looking around, and as he tries to look around, his head is just whirling. It's, like you said, he probably has a concussion. And the fact that it's, what, midday? Not going to help that. He appears to be in a garden. And he thinks of that girl's voice that startled him, and he looks around, finds a tree near him, and as he sees the tree, he sees a girl climbing out. Now this girl, very finely dressed, he's like, oh, every time I see a woman who's finely dressed, she's a dark friend and tries to kill me. Hopefully not this time, unless she just tried to kill me. <laughs> yeah. And then he notices, wow, she's gorgeous. <laughs> She's beautiful. She's, she's just, he notices she's a little, a little younger, younger, maybe, probably, you know, 17. He's probably 20. close to Egwene's age. 
Uh, she was a little younger maybe, than them too. I think Egwene was maybe like 18, 18, but so, yeah, it's close. approximately similar. He feels a twinge of guilt when he notices how beautiful she is because he um, thinks wait, of Egwene. I'm, I'm supposed to be, you know, with Egwene, and and Egwene's beautiful, and I'm thinking of other women now, and I Egwene, I don't even know where she is. She could be dead. But he's still confident she's not dead because he can't admit that they might not be alive. And yeah, the girl is looking at him. And as she's doing that, a boy drops out of the tree, too, right next to her. Looks close enough in, in appearance to obviously be closely related. It turns out they're brother and sister. Oh, good. Their names are Elaine and Gawain. Mm. Gawain is just a little older than Elaine, so closer to Rand's age. They, they have a little conversation saying, oh, man, I hope we don't get in trouble for this now. Because, uh, you know, it gets discovered with him having fallen down here that we were out here looking at Apparently Loghain. Apparently they weren't supposed to. Mother told us to stay in our rooms, and obviously we didn't do that. And they have this conversation, and then Elaine notices, oh, are you hurt? And yes, she notices Rand is hurt. He's got a wound in his scalp mm -hmm. and his hands are all ripped up from the climb. And, and she just goes into Florence Nightingale mode. Yeah, it's the escalation of like the kid who really young finds a small animal and tries to nurse them back to health. And later on, they grow up to try and do small injuries here and there. The, they're the first to react. They want to, they want to nurse people back to health. So, yep. She's using her first aid supplies. <laughs> she doesn't have a lot. And she's bossing Rand around, bossing Gawain around, you know, she hold seems... still and give me some water. And She seems used charge. to getting her way. Yes. And in the midst of the conversation and, and her bandaging him up and taking care of him, it comes out, you know, they keep talking about things, lots of things. And mother is referenced a bunch of times. And he says, who is your mother? And they kind of like have this dumbstruck look on their face and... Uh, Queen Morghese? Like, Obviously. you didn't know that? You, How would you not know? Everyone in knows. in the palace garden. <laughs> and they're shocked to discover Rand had no idea where and, he was. And Rand's just sitting there going, oh shit, I need to get out of here. He, yeah, very quickly would like to leave now. And they're like, um, and not even tell us your name. That's small thanks for having patched you up and everything. It's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So he quickly tells his name, Randall Thor tells where he's from, Emmons Field and the Two Rivers, and, and Gawain goes off on some big spiel explaining, oh yes, the Two Rivers, uh, known for tobacco and sheep, and he describes the people out there, and he explains it's part of my training as being, you know, part of the royal family here, and to be the first prince of the sword for my sister when she's queen. I need to know the realm. And as he's going off on all this information, then they hear another voice well, I want to mention there's something notable that we hear before this third voice shows up. Mm -hmm. It's about Gareth Bryn. Mm -hmm. We hear that it's not only that he's, is he the captain general of the guard, but apparently he and the queen got something going on. Well... No, no, it's directly said. Elaine says that she should just go ahead and marry him at this point. She doesn't but it see never why she says doesn't. they're actually like sleeping together, but that they do have a very close relationship. Yes. I don't think they were necessarily. I think that would, as that much would as I contradict it, Gareth his Brin's character. integrity. Yeah, as much as I, I want that to be true, I think you're right, actually. I, I don't think he would do it. I, think I do she, believe he would love to. However, if she commanded him to, I totally believe she, that he would. <laughs> so they might have been. <laughs> but that would ruin everything. You don't command like that. No, that's and not cool. That's actually noted. Her mother, the queen, is a very commanding woman, and yet she suggests things to him, and he does what she suggests. She doesn't order him. So now this other voice. Yes. They are discovered by someone who says, uh, what's this? Um, stand away from him, Elaine. You too, Gawain. Cue the tool who actually isn't the worst character in the series. This is Galad, and... I will probably end up saying Galad at times. I'm sorry. And Galad, Galad, both ways sound good to me. So we can say whatever works. Galad seems anglicized. It's like, yeah, we're American. We'll say Galad. You know, no, look at Galad, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Galad is the older half-brother of these two. And he instantly recognizes Rand as a strange man in the garden with my two younger siblings, and he's wearing a sword, and this should not be. Therefore, the logical thing that he thinks is one of two things. Either one, I try to kill him now, or two, I immediately go and tell the guard. Clearly, he's going to take some action of some sort, and Elaine is like, no, he is my guest. He is under my protection. He is a loyal queensman of the realm. 
this doesn't work for Galad. He's like, um, okay, you're vouching for him. That's fine. Let's go see what the guards and our mother think. <laughs> and uh, Elaine just is still being very insistent and petulant. Like you said earlier, she's clearly used to getting her way. Galad just ends up leaving. It's And they're like, oh, no, he's going to go no. tell. They complain. Elaine clearly hates Galad. Gawain very begrudgingly brings up that he's not a bad person. In fact, apparently he saved his life not once but twice. And Gawain has an official title. Once Elaine becomes queen, will be the first prince of the sword. However, mentions if Galad had not saved him, he would have that title instead. And Elaine just doubles down on hating him. Screw Galad. It's one of the the plot points in Wheel of Time that I I do find somewhat annoying. It's irrational how much Elaine doesn't like Galad. It's arguable that Elaine just is a stubborn, irrational character at a lot of times. And as much as I hate that as a reader, I also admit I've run into people in my life who are wonderful people who are very passionate about the things they do, but when it comes to someone differing from their opinion, are very stubborn and irrational about what it is. Now, Elaine points out, okay, Rand, we do need to get you out of here really quickly now. And Gawain explains, this is because of Galad. He has this issue where he will always do the right thing as he perceives it, no matter what. And in this case, you're a stranger in the gardens, and it doesn't matter that you're a perfectly good person and and that you're in here completely by accident. And in fact, we kind of caused it for you to fall in like that. None of that will matter to him. You're, you're a stranger here, with a sword in the garden. Sword. He's going to go report you. And the guards will be here any moment. We got to get you out of here. Too Except late. Except it's too late. Yep. <laughs> Suddenly, there are Queen's guards pouring into the garden. Apparently, this 19-year-old something, Galad, got out of eyesight and sprinted to the nearest guard. Not only that, from the way these guards come pouring in, he clearly said, There's a stranger in the garden with a sword! Go protect the princess! And they come running out with their swords <laughs> drawn. Like, Dude, you didn't tell them the whole story. Oh, man, they could have just come in archer shooting. And Not so the guards cool. come in. They're all ready for this. They've got their swords drawn. And Elaine is like, I'm sorry. Slow the F down. You dare to draw a sword at me? Yeah, specifically talking to the, the head person here, Talonvor. Remember that name. It's a surprising one, but it will come up again. Many times. He's the officer amongst this group. He does say, you know, this reaction, you know, calm down. There's no problem here. And he says, my lady, forgive me, but Lord... How do you say that? I want to know. Galadadrid. Galadadrid? Yeah, Lord Galadadrid. Galadadrid Damadrid? (laughs) Poor child. (laughs) He reported a dirty peasant skulking in the gardens, armed and endangering my lady Elaine and my Lord Gawain. See, exactly what we said, you know? Armed and endangering. Technically, he's not wrong. So step aside, I will take the villain into custody. (laughs) And Elaine says that, and this one's very important, that she doubts what Galad reported anything like that, because Galad does not lie. So again, he probably said something closer to what we'd said earlier, and Talonvor took it as meaning. However, there's some bad guy in the I personally just, that singular sentence, Galad does not lie, is a huge point of his character. This guy, yes, he's kind of a tool, but he's a really honorable dude. But he's the one that'll be married someday, and his wife will say, does this dress make me look fat? And he'll say, yes. Yeah. (laughs) Nothing else. He'll say, yeah. Now, I'm a little bit in the camp of saying, if she's asking, she actually wants your opinion. You and Galad might get along. But you also have to be ready to take the hate for it. Elaine tries to play the princess card again, and, you know, this man is my guest, you may withdraw. Basically, get out of here, it's fine. And Talonvor says, I can't do that. Because he's still got a sword, and he's here, and... Well, and there's been orders that anyone on the palace grounds without the queen's permission must be sent... Well, word of that must be sent immediately to the queen. Therefore, she'll know, and she'll want to see him. Now, it'd be one thing if this was just a normal day. But this is a special time. There's something funky going on here. Loghain is being brought in. People are extra on edge here. This is a high tense, high alert situation. And there's an intruder. Yeah. So they have to actually deal with it. They can't just let it slide. Rand kind of looks at Gawain and Gawain's like, eh, prison, dude. Sorry. Only a few days. You won't be harmed. You know, if you are who you said, you're, you're yeah. going to be fine. It's You'll get just stuck in a, a cell bit of for a little bit. We're sorry. But once everything gets cleared up, then you can get out of your cell. You maybe will get your belongings back to you and you can get out. 
Then Elaine gets a brain. Oh man, I forget the term I wanted to say. She gets an idea. Yeah, but that, it was a different phrase I was gonna say. <laughs> brain blast. No, that wasn't it. But anyways, she says you may take all three of us to my mother. Talonvor is like, what? Take us all to my mother, or take us all to a cell. This is my guest. I am staying with him. She immediately doubles down, claims him as her guest, and says that she will take responsibility. She doesn't know this guy, but she's taking responsibility for him. But she does know Talonvor. It's clear from the way this interaction has gone, she's bossed him around before. And yes. usually he has to follow her orders. Because very clearly, Talonvor's a guy, he's a good guy, but he's also a very by-the-book guy. If the book says to do it this way, he's going to end up doing it that way. And if someone throws extra legal code around him, he'll have to follow by what is proper. He's good at his job. And truthfully, that's kind of admirable. Now, she was really trying to be a little fancier here. She's saying, we're going to stay together. So either take us immediately to my mother or take us all to a cell. And she knows Talonvor is not going to put them in a cell. No, she's hoping that Talonvor just lets him go then goes, it's too much trouble. Well, not just because it's too much trouble. She knows her mother is busy, is with Loghain. Yeah. And so she doesn't have time for them right now. So what you going to do, Talonvor? And Talonvor goes, I'm calling your bluff. We're going to your mother. That's right. I've been commanded to bring the intruder to her immediately. So I shall take you all as well. Let's go. And Elaine's like, oh, crap. And Gawain is like, oh, that is not what they were hoping, especially as Morghese apparently has a temper. So this this may not go well. And so we walk through the garden. We see a number of things. Rand is amazed at what he sees. He, uh, there's especially these uh, flowers, these rose bushes that have numerous different roses, different colors. They're all in full bloom, even though this is still shortly after winter. Yes, it's kind of getting to spring, but it's a little early for it. And he notices there are green, like vibrant Everything's green. Vibrant, yeah. These aren't natural, Gawain explains. It's Elida's work. Yep, she's been using the one power to make the garden green. Making the roses red. Making the roses red. What is that from? Alice in Wonderland. There you go. Except you're wrong, it's painting. Yeah, sorry. Painting the roses red. Elida doesn't paint, except with spirit or air or whatever. Sure. She all paints right, with so... all the colors of the wind. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. So as they're being marched to the throne room, Elaine is, gives Rand a little bit of advice. Mm -hmm. You know, remember yourself, speak up clearly when you're spoken to, follow my lead, all will be well. And so they're walking in and we get a little more world building. First, there are servants and these guards are all in various red livery. Their collars, cuffs are also white and there's a lion on their tunics. So we learned a couple things. One, the red that's with the swords to represent the queen has to do with her color or perhaps the color of Andor. But second, that the house or the country is associated with the lion itself. This has some vague ties to some historical stuff, but it's not modeled directly from it as what I've heard. That's accurate from what you know, yes? Yeah. Robert Jordan's, I won't say stole, he modeled his world off of an um, amalgamation of mm -hmm. a number of different cultures and ideas throughout human history, but was very cognizant of the fact that none of these are copies. They are bits and pieces stolen here and there to make something new. Yeah. All right. So eventually they do make it to the, the court, the, the room where they will be received by the queen. Elaine does note that it's good where they're at because it's it's a particular one where she's never ordered someone's head cut off. That's Gawain. Oh, Gawain says that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> Whew, at least that should, that should be okay. They get in here. Elaine drops into a deep curtsy. Gawain goes ahead and, and does a uh, kind of a certain kind of bow, as does Talonvor. I think Talonvor does. They do different bows, technically. Talonvor just kind of bows and then steps back. As they're presented, Elaine, Gawain, and Rand kind of step forward there. Talonvor is just right behind Rand there. And while Elaine does a curtsy and Gawain does kind of a formal balance thing, Talonvor just does a bow. Gawain does a stance with his hand on his sword, and Rand does the same thing, copying Gawain, who's next to him. It says Gawain and the other men. He emulates Gawain and the other men. I think they all did that. 
Down on his right knee, head bowed, bending forward to press the knuckles of his right hand against the marble tiles. But notably, for some reason... left hand resting on the end of his sword hilt. For some reason, Talonvor doesn't look happy with him. No. Rand's just, whew, figured this one out. Yes! Country (laughs) bumpkin for the win! I got it this time. It's like, not supposed to do that. Uh, What have I done Mm. wrong? And we are greeted and meet some new individuals that we've heard about but have not yet seen. Yes. Obviously, there's the queen, Queen Morgase, on the throne that's in this room. And next to her stands, It's he's described as a... Um, Bluff, blocky man. He's got some gray in his hair, but he does look still strong, mm-hmm. capable, not someone you want to take in a fight. He's the Captain General, Gareth Bryn. And behind the throne and to the other side, a woman in deep green silk sitting there knitting. I'll be honest, I always sit here and I imagine that it's a red dress because I imagine they always wear their color. <laughs> they don't always wear Because they colors. do a lot of the time. Especially, she does a lot of the time. So I Especially complete... as the series goes further along. I think. Yeah, yeah, but I completely forgot that she was wearing green here. Yeah, yeah, and she's just knitting. Like the flowers that Rand Seems had to noticed. Seems totally focused on her knitting. We don't know who it is yet. We will learn in a moment. Morgase. Queen Morgase is described as quite beautiful. Mm-hmm. Her Basically, daughter's looks beauty like... matured and exactly, ripened. Exactly, exactly. This is what a, a grown-up Elaine. Can we say that's like. a euphemism for uh, having increased assets? I don't think so entirely. Because I, How do I you think Elaine view... already has assets. Mm. <laughs> I don't you don't think, think that develops over the next year no, or so? No, I think she's already endowed. Mm. Yeah. Robert Jordan liked his woman big eyes. to be big in the eye. No, I, I, yeah, that's not it. I think it's more we're talking about there is a difference between someone in their late teens, early 20s, and when they hit late 20s, early 30s, where now they look like an adult. But that's it. Clearly, she looks like she's in... Maybe her early 30s, mid 30s. She looks a little young for what her age actually is. She should theoretically be about your age, I think. Not quite that old. Early 40s. Because she would have been a young adult when Rand was born. Yeah, but, you know... Before that, even. You end up on the throne... She'd have to be at least, like, 45. No, because she could have easily risen to the throne already as 18, 19. And yet, I think that was 25 years ago, at least. I think it was Maybe. before the IEO war. I, I put her in her 40s. And we all agree there. Maybe early 40s. Okay, so this is Queen Morgais. This is the mother. She's not happy. Rand, you know, kind of glancing, <laughs> uh, notices her great serpent ring. Which is notable because we've seen it one other place. Moraine's finger. That's right. It seems to be something that denotates... Notates? Notates. What is English? Notes. Denotate. Denotes. I don't know. I don't know. English is hard, guys. For any of you who it's not your first language, I'm sorry, because it's it's not great. It it is my first, and it's still bad. But it signifies some level of Isodiness. She is clearly not happy. She notices or notes you've been climbing trees, daughter. Hmm. Despite you having orders not to, you found a way to look at Loghain and Gawain. I thought better of you. You've got to learn not only to obey your sister, but at the same time, be a counterweight for her against disaster. And Elaine opens her mouth and says, yo, look, I mean, she does much more respectfully than I'm about to, but I wanted to go see. Everyone else in the city got to go see. Gawain just came to keep me safe because he can't do that from his room. Okay, don't blame him. It was me. But what did I do wrong? Everybody else did it. But not everybody else is the daughter heir of Andor. Yeah. She's chastising her children. She's yeah. not happy with them. It happens. That's right. And then we move to the other person in the room. And Rand stares at this other person because she does speak up. She mentions, you know, you need to obey your mother and you're soon going to be heading off to Tarvalon. Tarvalon, we don't know how soon. And you're going to, before you know it, wish you were back here where you could just listen to your mother. Because they are going to work you hard. And they are going to turn you into the best possible person to be the next Queen of Andor. But for now, you're just a kid still, basically, she's saying. Cut it out. Elida, the Aes Sedai, can have a sudden, a certain sternness to her. And as she gets this position, Rand realizes this must be who it is. Mm-hmm. Morgay's kind of shuts down enough of, let's not berate Elaine more. She gets it. We'll deal with her. Let's deal with the young man who's standing here, the one who has a sword and dropped into the garden. 
And Elaine goes on the defensive. Mom, uh, he's just one of our, our great people of this land. She spins some great rhetoric, talking about how she should get to know the citizens. He's a loyal subject from the Two Rivers. Uh, I wanted to get to know him. It, I can learn from him better than I could from books. Yeah, this goes off the rails very quick. A loyal subject from the Two Rivers that cracks Morghese up. Because apparently that's not a thing which Rand could have told you because he didn't know he was part of Andor. That's right. She said, we haven't had a tax man in the Two Rivers in six generations. They, they don't... probably don't even think they're part of the realm. It's which like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> is true. And Elida goes, are we sure he's from the Two Rivers? Are we sure that's not a load of bullshit? I mean, look at how he looks. And Rand is like, I was born in Emmons Field. My mother was an outlander. That's where my eyes come from. My father is Tam El Thor, a shepherd and farmer, as I am. Elida, not necessarily oh, yeah. convinced. Totally a shepherd with a heron-marked sword. Those last few words, everything gets tense. Talonvor, everybody knows Gareth what that means. Bryn, he's like, we have someone with a heron-marked sword in the presence of the queen. That's not good. Legit. If, if Rand actually A, deserved it, and B, was malicious in his intent, Morghais could be dead right now. And that's not something to just laugh off. So none of them do. So they start talking about this sword just a little bit. Morghais is like, uh, clearly he's too young to have a heron-marked blade. And I want to give some props to my boy, Gareth Bryn, who doesn't evaluate his skill or anything, but does note that it looks like it belongs with him. Yeah, he's too young, but somehow his. that sword is his. I don't know how you exactly can tell that a sword belongs to someone, especially if they... Bran doesn't know how to use this thing very well. So Lan did teach him how to stand a little bit. Maybe that helps, but... I don't know. Now, this is where the truth, he starts trying to tell some of the truth, and it actually makes things worse. Yeah. So where did you get that sword? My father gave it to me. Oh, the shepherd in the two rivers had a heron mark blade that he just gave to you. As a side note, he does drop the name, and a part of me wants to believe that theoretically someone would possibly recognize that name, but it has been 20 some odd years. But Tam El Thor wasn't in Andor. He no, he wouldn't. Elsewhere. He definitely wouldn't be recognized as much, but he could be. I don't know. So, okay, we'll need to check your story a bit. Uh, when did you arrive in Camelin? And he says, today, this morning. Oh, now he's starting to That's lie. That's a lie. Yes. Just in time. Hmm, where are you staying? The Crown and Lion. Don't say the Queen's Blessing. Another Don't say the lie. Queen's Blessing. <laughs> I have a bed there in the attic. Oh, see, that's true. So he's blending truth and lies. The best lies are close to the truth. Yes. You basically tell the truth with a couple subtle twists. And then he emphasizes, yes, I am from the two rivers. I'm not just claiming it. I am. The queen tries to pin down Elida. So what are you saying? Are you naming him a dark friend? Are you saying he's one of Loghain's followers? She's like, mm, well, I mean, this one is dangerous. I could say that. And we hear a kind of lore drop. Not exactly. We don't get much explanation, but we get something thrown out here as there's talk of, is he dangerous? Is he not? Elida, is this a foretelling? Dad, what's a foretelling? A foretelling is a talent. With a capital T? Yes. It's not something that's tied to the one power necessarily. Although most who have foretelling do seem to be Aes Sedai but there can be other kinds of foretelling. But it's basically someone who is seeing something from the future and speaking it. They don't always speak it like you're watching it on a TV. I mean, they, they speak it in ways that are prophecy. And while later in the books it seems this is something largely out of their control, Elida seems to demonstrate some amount of control here as she pulls back and says the things that she said were not a foretelling. However, this I foretell. And she says, From this day, Andor marches towards pain and division. The shadow has yet to darken its blackest. And I cannot see if the light will come after. Where the world has wept one tear, it will weep thousands. This I foretell. But then she continues looking into Rand's eyes, so soft that he could barely hear her. And this basically... It's basically just to him. This too I foretell. Pain and division come to the whole world, and this man stands at the heart of it. I obey the queen and speak it clearly. That's foretelling. That is real foretelling. Lyda can sense this. She can see this. She doesn't entirely know how this is all going to happen. But she knows there is something very, very dangerous and about so Randall Thor. And so while we don't know a whole lot about this, 
Everything that people in this palace room, Elida and Rand, view about the future events as they start to unfold is going to be shaped by this small paragraph here. So the queen is trying to figure out what to do with this person. She's got her daughter, who's vouching for him. She's got Elida, who's saying he's dangerous. She asks Lord Gareth, Captain General, what's your opinion? Says, well, Elida says she's dangerous, so uh, get summon the headsman. But all she says is what any of us can see with our own eyes. There's not a farmer in the countryside who won't say things get will get worse <laughs> without foretelling. For myself, eh, I think he's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. You could clap him in a cell until Elaine and Gawain have headed off to Tarvalon, Tarvalon, and then let him go. No problem there. That's what I might suggest. Morghese finally is going to get to the point where she's just got to make a decision. And we get to a little bit of politics here. And reading between the lines a little bit, we can see that Morghese understands the division happening in her nation. The problem we saw with the white and red, the ever-growing presence of white cloaks, and people throwing out dark friends here and there, and she says she wasn't going to be part of that. So she kind of goes, hold on, Mr. Randall Thor, dude, do you swear that what you say is true? I mean no harm to anyone, my queen, to you and yours least of all. And all this was an accident, you just were trying to look at the false dragon. Heck yeah! <laughs> and you don't mean to hurt anybody, especially not us definitely not then as much as i can tell from figuring all this stuff i'm just a whole let bunch you go. of things considered you can go she does mention you know i do have a benefit that elida and gareth don't i've actually heard two rivers speech before when She's i was met young. someone from the two rivers so i know the way you talk is how the people in the two rivers talk so that gives you some credibility which and this story you gave about the heron mark blade no one would make that up. That is ridiculous. So you're probably telling the truth. If she remembers someone who had two rivers on the tongue, it probably was Tam Althor, <laughs> who gets name dropped, who would have had a heron marked sword. It doesn't mean she would have remembered. No, but if she remembers that she met a singular person. And she was young. And she recognizes the tongue. Maybe. She probably would have some idea that this is actually a thing. Anyways, long story short, he's getting a little slap on the wrist and getting escorted quickly out of the palace. Without getting anything taken away, really. Mm -hmm. It's a scary... It's like getting marched down the principal's office only to be told to go back to class. So out you go. I believe it's Talonvor that escorts him out. Pretty much opens the door and checks him out. But I believe Elaine and Gawain do go with him. They say it's customary to escort a guest, which... Okay, let's be real here. Is Rand a guest? Is he a prisoner? Is he a person of interest? All of these things are probably true. But as things go, he gets escorted out. And right as... there at the end, there's, mm -hmm. there's one last little important conversation where... There's three things that I think we learn here. Okay. What um, do you want to say? So Gawain is saying, says a comment to Rand. And he says, truthfully, wrap a shufo around your head and you would be the image of an Aiel man. And that's the most important piece in that, I think. Mm-hmm. Which is the final thing. That's the one I was going to emphasize. But you said two mm -hmm. other things. No, no. In that singular statement, I think we've learned three things. Oh, one. Else? Rand looks like an Aiel man. That's the simple one. Yeah, which he's been hearing from no, numerous avenues. Two, Aiel apparently wear something wrapped around their head called a shufa. Yeah, we have no idea what that means, but yes. But it's a it's a thing that is known, apparently. And three, Gawain has seen Aiel, or at least heard very close descriptions of them. Maybe seen drawings. Yep, okay. All right, so he's out, and he's like, oh, I think I look like an Aielman too. Uh, and he uh, takes off, head back to the inn. And that is the end of the chapter. What a close call. Now, this has gotten really long. True. It'll be a little less long. We'll cut some of it. Uh, it's not going to be short enough, so I'm going to suggest we stop here. And we will pick we'll up... do one more ep one more chapter, but we'll let's, let's issue it as a midweek. Okay. So that you don't uh, have to listen to two solid hours of us talking. I know some podcasts do that, but that feels a little long. So we'll give you a short one midweek to cover just chapter 41 to keep us on track. But until then, there's uh, the regular things that we need to share with them. And that would be, again, please, we encourage you to subscribe, rate, and review us anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you want to talk to us and tell us what you thought about what we said today or anything about fantasy fiction at all, you can write to us at fantasyfortheages at gmail.com 
or connect to us on our social medias. Be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or come talk to us directly on Discord. I'll put an invite link in the show notes to our Discord server. We'd love to see you join our group that's slowly growing there. And we'd certainly invite you to become a patron and join us on our Patreon page. There's a link for that too. It's a place that, yes, a little monetary support that you send our way, you get some extra benefits. Like being able to join us for our live recordings. We're getting early access to these episodes as soon as they're done in the editing room. And uh, we'll be also putting out eventually some uh, special uh, fun things just for our patrons. So those who uh, sign up, there's five different tiers you can pick decide how much you're willing to contribute towards us and that decides what benefits you get to enjoy that's all i have to say anything else Zach? i've got nothing all right we'll talk to you next time